It's a beautiful day here at the Y Marsh. We can hear the geese. And birds, lots of birds. I'm impressed at how many birds there are. And if you get tired, you have a seat. I'll see that on the way back because there's a lot of trails. There's a lot of trails here. I'm going to get exhausted. At least I have this to use as a walking stick. And dress appropriately. Yes, in layers, even if they're ugly layers. Make sure you dress in layers because it's better to have too many clothes than not enough. Says you. That's true. <laughs> I can almost guarantee there'd be oh, uh, see what I salamanders can. and uh, newts. What are the rules about going off trail? And here we have worms. These are all the animals of decay. And decay is huge. We need all of these animals in order for there to be growth in the forest. We have fungus, which like it dark. And it's definitely dark under this log. And moist. And moist. And that's all food for amphibians and... Yep, and I was hoping to find some salamander under here, but not this time. And always make sure that you put things back exactly where you found them. That way, and do it gently so nobody gets squashed. You ready? I'll do, do the heavy one. Oh. oh. Oh, we've got a little burrower here. Can you pull it back just a little bit more? Perfect. We've got something digging a tunnel here, probably a little mouse. So you can definitely see that somebody is living here. And that's why you want to make sure that you put it back. There's this is also part lichen. of the tunnel. Yep. So this is like a city that you never see, but all the animals that eat these animals, they know exactly where it is. I think it's more like a buffet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the mandarin for salamanders. Salamandarin. <laughs> I apologize now for the bad puns. There'll be a lot of them. Oh, come on, that was funny. <laughs> Something is moving right around here. Okay. You sure it's not just the stick? No, it was something that just moved on that side. It wasn't very big, didn't even sound like a mouse because it didn't keep moving. Okay. Let me see if maybe it's under here. You ready? Yep. and that's it. Yeah, it might have been a big bug. It might have been. And then exactly back where we started from. Teamwork. You know what, I don't think we're gonna find any salamanders. I find salamanders more under rocks anyway. Yeah, I just figured so. these are closest to the... Yeah. Now this one here, you'll notice that there's the rock sticking up, which gives it a base. When this is down, it's tight, but there's actually now two stories in there. So there's enough space in there for even mice to live underneath that log. Great place to hide because there's lots of owls and birds of prey around here. That's a good place to live. When you're looking for this, for snakes, <laughs> perfect. This is exactly what you're looking for. Although garbage metals as well heat up better and you're going to see snakes under old tin roofs and even um, big ceramic uh, blocks. It retains heat really well. Snakes need that. It's still a little cool in the morning. It's probably only about 8 right now. As the day warms up, turtles will be active, snakes will be active. So they'll be just waiting in there, warming up, soaking up the sun. It's old beaver chew. What is beaver chew? I don't see any nests or anything, any dams. Doesn't matter, it's still beaver chew. No, 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 but I, like, I don't see any right here. Okay. Oh yeah, no, they'll take these sometimes up to a mile away. Oh yeah, and this would be probably for their uh, lodge. All with their teeth, can you imagine? They keep growing and growing and growing. Yeah. If I'm gonna build a place that I'm gonna live in, 
out here in the middle of winter, it better be warm. <laughs> I always thought you were going to say you'd rather build it with your teeth. No. Hey, check it out, rhubarb. This here is some wild rhubarb. The leaves themselves are poison. The stalks are not, which is kind of odd. And then here we have wild raspberry as well. And those haven't flowered yet. It's entirely too early for that. But they'll flower and then they'll have fruit. So knowing what's around you, you'll be able to eat if you get lost and you haven't brought yourself some Skittles, something tasty. The world will provide Skittles for you. So we're looking at a turtle right across the way here, out having a nice sun. It looks to me like a painted turtle. He looks like a rock. That's a fairly large one too. How old do you figure that turtle is, Chris? At least six or seven. Still not old for a turtle. No. These are turtle slides here. You can see where the turtles have made their own little paths through the reeds. They don't just go crashing through the weeds unless they're running from something. They have their little paths that they take. They want to make it as easy on themselves as possible. Constant use, breaking it down. And probably. a lot of them will actually eat the plants as well, yep. thin it out. They've probably been here for generations. Little things that most people won't notice. Even where people interact, sometimes you'll pull canoes up and it'll leave a track in the mud that disturbs the growth of the plants, makes it easier for the turtles. They've been around for millions and millions of years learning how to survive. Oh, they got a whole duck plat plateau here. Black. I didn't realize there were that many ducks. What's your favorite duck on there? Daffy. I always like the harlequin. They're so nifty. I think the wood duck. I've always been a fan, just the colors. I always like it because their babies plunge 20 feet to the ground. Yeah, they're impressive. They are. They nest in trees, which is wacky for a duck. If you look up there to the top of that dead tree, you will see a red-winged blackbird. And their song is absolutely synonymous with the marsh. Robert Frost said uh, two paths diverged in the woods. And we take the road less traveled. Actually, we probably take the road never traveled. Because I am not seeing any sign of human footprint here at all. Well, it couldn't have just ended, so. No, it's not ended. We've got a map. It has a vague outline of where we should be. And as long as there's trails, you're going to end up back at the main area in the front. We hope. If not, we've got layers. These are our last messages. Please tell our loved ones that we had fun on our last day. <laughs>
Yeah, uh, is it the feathers that make it such a quiet flyer for hunting? Uh, yep, actually all along the outside of his feather edges here, I'm not sure if you can see that, there's little serrated edges. Oh, so it breaks up the sound when the wind goes over it, mm -hmm. muffles it. Oh, kind of like a, an exaust, that a silencer on an exhaust. Mm -hmm. Oh, very good. The neat thing about the eagle owl, though, is when they swoop in to pick up their prey, they will actually use their wings to push the air down so their the wind will actually lift their prey up into the air so they have an easier time grasping them. So this is Alice. <laughs> this is like a smaller version of the one we just saw. Really nice looking bird. What type of bird is this? Alice is a European tawny owl. Okay, so we've got the Europeans covered mm -hmm. for this section. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys get birds in um, from different places. Where would you say most of the birds come in? Uh, most of our birds are from Central Ontario School of Falconry. Okay, so, they so they're all captive raised. Yes. And then they imprint on people as well? Mm -hmm. So this is not a good idea to ever think you can take a bird out of the wild? No, I don't recommend it. Okay, and in Ontario we have pretty strict rules about animals that are native to Ontario? Yes, we do. Um, in order to have wildlife in captivity, you have to have a permit with the Ministry of Natural Resources. Okay. And in order to take a bird of prey out of the wild, uh, you need to be a licensed falconer with the Ministry also. And her feet are so much smaller compared to the last one we saw. Yeah, I mean, he had great big feet. She is nocturnal, you can tell by her dark eyes. Oh, and she's got a little fluff right up on her nose as well. What is that for, above the beak? Um, those help her to sense where her food is. They have great vision long distances, but their vision is not so good up close. So instead she'll use that to feel where her prey is. And does she do the same thing with her wings? Does she swoop down and um, use her wings as, as a swooping up? Uh, nope, she'll go in feet first. Oh, okay, so you're all business with those little feet. Mm -hmm. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much, Shelley, for sharing your friends with us. And if you'd like to learn more about the birds of prey, come out to the Y Marsh and join us out here. I'll join Shelly out here. Gently. Hello, Swan. How you doing? So here I am in front of, well, beside a swan. This is a trumpeter swan. And the Y Marsh has 10% of Ontario's population of trumpeter swans. And this is one of that 10%. And he's just happily sitting here. His bill is probably the length of my hand, which is a very big beak. And if this were a nest, that's why I'm kind of figuring this is a male, if this were a nest, I would not be sitting here right now. He would be attacking me with the beak and his incredibly long wings, which are probably also the length of my arms. And uh, these guys are much bigger and much heavier than the owls and the hawks and they can do some pretty wicked damage. You can tell he's used to being around people. In mating and breeding season, there's no way you'd have such a calm swan and you'd be able to get this close to it. Did you get oh, it? Oh yes! Awesome! Alright, now this one's still fairly small. I'm gonna put him over the net. There you go. 
So he's not very big for a frog, for a leopard frog, but he's big enough that he'll be out right now looking for females. There he goes. And this size, he has to be careful for fish and <laughs> birds. Oh, he's so cute. Can I let him go? Sure. Thank you. Now, you don't have to have an elaborate net. This one, got it this, at the dollar store. This one's even better. Or as a novice netter. <laughs> this is This my, is fun for kids too. Yep, this is my magical wand of knowledge. Ooh. Okay, I get to let him go, right? You do. Yay! And when you catch one, make sure you're very careful and you let him go where you found him. And don't fall in. I'll hang on to her back here, which is just testing me. Hey. See, now the frog's pretty calm. Hand. Maybe because the water's still so chilly. There he goes. Back into the reeds, where frogs belong. And this is just one small segment of a huge wetlands. So you'll find all kinds of stuff around here. We haven't seen a lot of beetles moving around yet, but with this stick, you can also do this to move around some of the mud in the bottom. That's where all the larvae will develop. And that's where the frogs are gonna eat, the fish, the turtles, the birds, everything. Right there, that's the buffet. That's the table right there for everybody. Now we're here with Jill. Hi. She's our beautiful rudder for today while we're <laughs> canoeing in the marshlands of Wai Marsh. And most people don't think about open water when it comes to a marsh, but here we are, open water. Mm -hmm. And why are we doing this, Jill? Why are we canoeing? It's, it's an excellent way to get in touch with nature, um, to get up close with it and personal. It's very peaceful out here. You, you learn a lot and you get some exercise at the same time, canoeing some, some hard work, especially on a windy day like today. <laughs> well, you're talking about wildlife. Uh, what is this box here with the big number seven on it? Um, that's actually one of our bird boxes. So there'll be like different feed and stuff in there for red winged blackbirds, um, blue jays, little birds like that. Okay. Now, are there, is there a border around here that you're allowed to cross or that you're not allowed to cross? Is it somebody else's property or is this all Weimar? Um, this is all Weimar. There's actually 3,000 acres really? of marshland here. Yep. Not That's all of it is accessible by canoe. Um, like you can see, there, it's, pretty, it's pretty barriered by cattails and, and we have some lilies and stuff. So yeah, it gets pretty tricky at some parts, but for the most part, um, there are a lot of nice clear paths like you're seeing. I love so, this. You can see the nests. Yes. <laughs> Getting real close with nature there. Yes, we're going Ooh. under a bridge. <laughs> okay. So this is actually our dip, one of our dip netting stations to your right here. Oh. Um, we have a lot of different public programs that run. People can come in actually on their own and test it out. So they actually dip into the marsh. Um, and disturb kind of like the muddy areas and they'll scoop up different insects and bugs and stuff like that. Now why would that be important? It's important just to understand different types of habitat um, and they kind of act as a filter underwater okay. for the most part. Would I mean, they be people, a, an indicator of the health of the marsh as well? Or? Um, yep. Okay. Yep. I mean they're all part of the food chain too. Some of these lily pads are red and some of them are green and some of them are shaped differently. Yes. Are the red ones dead or are nope, they a different it's, species? Um, they're not a different species. There are two different types of lily pads. Um, most of it actually is, well, it is still springtime, so things are still coming into full bloom. Okay. So you're going to see a lot of different colors. See this one to your right here? It's kind of green in the middle, so eventually it will turn fully green. Really? Yep. So it's kind of reverse fall. Yes, yeah, so they were, they're, they're all kind of peeking up now, and, and they're actually, 
If you see the little green balls, those are flowers. Those are those are lily flowers. If you can look, if you really? can see them, yeah. yeah. So they're gonna kind of open up, and uh, and there'll be a nice, beautiful yellow flower. Really? Yes. And then later on, we'll have white water lilies that will come up as well. So different stages of the marsh, different flowers coming. Up. Yes. Yeah. Keep your eyes open for turtles, guys. Actually, because. It's a cooler day, but we might still get a chance to see them. They love to come out in the nice hot sun because just like frogs, they are cold-blooded as well, so they love basking. Now this looks like a, a prime area for a turtle to chill. This out. is absolutely, and the reason that it's probably a little bit bald area here, sorry, we can paddle forward, um, is because they spend so much time there, they probably chomped away at at uh, the cattails. Snapping turtles are actually not scary at all. The only reason that they that they snap is because it's the only defense they have against predators. I know I snap when I get upset. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's much like that. Maybe a snapping turtle's the same way. So can we paddle backwards on the left side? The gentleman's side? Yes. We're gonna paddle backwards there. We usually come about this the opposite way. Like we're used to, we're going backwards. So we can paddle forward now. We often do everything backwards when it comes to Chris and I. Yeah. It's okay if we bump into it a bit there. There we go. As long as we don't Titanic our canoe, we'll be okay. We'll be okay. Yeah. Um, Titanic. And we hit oh, the iceberg. I thought that was going to be a lot harder. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I was saying, Snapping turtles are really not that scary okay. at all. The only reason that they snap is because on the bottom of their shell, which is called their plastron, um, they don't, they're not fully covered. Okay. So like any other turtle, if they felt afraid, they usually tuck right into their shell. So arms, that's legs, their soft head. underbelly. Yes, okay. yes. So a snapping turtle doesn't have a full plastron, so they don't have the ability to completely protect themselves oh, in their that shell. Makes sense, then. Yeah, so their defense is to snap. <laughs> yes. Do you guys see that? That's awesome. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Red osier dogwood, if you can see the roots, oh, they're red. Um, and past natives actually used to use these to make baskets. Really? Because it's very, very strong stuff, nice and colorful, um, so it's aesthetically pleasing <laughs> for different gifts and stuff. Beautiful and functional. Yes, yeah. Very nice. Now what's this big wooden structure here for? Yep, it doesn't look like anything. It's an observation blind, so the pieces actually that are cut out of it are there for a reason and it's so that people can actually put their face right up to it and look out to specific spots in the marsh. It's actually quiet. You don't get that very often. It's beautiful out here. I can't hear any road noise at all. It's sad to always come across this kind of thing. It's always sad to come across this thing. But this is what happens, you know? If there's going to be life, there has to be death. And this little guy will actually end up being part of the food chain. And ants will eat it. Whatever comes across, it'll eat it. But uh, we're going to show it some respect, and we're going to move it off the pathway. So we've had a wonderful time here at Weimarsh. Thanks for joining us. We had lots of adventures. We did lots of stuff today. We did a lot of stuff today. I'm exhausted. It was fun. It was nice, perfect weather. Couldn't have asked for better. And we found lots of animals. We saw lots of animals, lots of plants, lots of trees, lots of birds. Very cool birds. Very cool birds. I did like those. Birds of prey. You can't beat them. Can't. Fantastic. Join us next time on Out and About in Simcoe County. <laughs>